what's next. Brethren and sisters, I commend to you the ex excellent addresses that have been given here this morning by Sister Smith and the brethren. As I listen to their addresses down on the front row, I kept thinking over and over what the Savior said when he, when he said, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? And it rolled over and over and over in my mind. Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? There are many people in the church today who have failed and continue to argue against it, doing the things that are re requested, suggested by this great organization. The Lord said also, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And I was thinking that there are as many wards and branches in the church as there are people in this room. And uh, one for one. And what great accomplishment would be accomplished if every bishop and every branch president in all the world, wherever it's possible, of course there are a few places where this is not permitted, if they themselves had a storage such as has been suggested here this morning, if they had storage and then they took to their three or four or five hundred members the same message and they quoted the scripture and they insisted upon the people of their wards and branches doing the things the Lord has requested. For we know that there are many who are failing. And then I hear them argue, suppose we do put away a lot and then someone comes and takes it from us, our neighbors who do not believe. That's been answered this morning. And so my feeling is today that we emphasize these two scriptures. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And the other, uh, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say. To think of the number of people represented here today, the stake presidents, mission presidents, and others who are directors, who have many people under them with 750 stakes and all of them included, including hundreds, sometimes thousands of members. See the power that we have if we go to work and actually push this matter until it is done. We talk about it, we listen to it, but sometimes we do not do the things which the Lord says. Brethren, we've gathered here this morning to consider the important program which we must never forget nor put in the background. As we become more affluent and our bank accounts enlarge, there comes a feeling of security and we feel sometimes that we do not need the supply that has been suggested by the brethren. It lies there and deteriorates, we say. And suppose it does, we can reestablish it. 
We must remember that conditions could change and a year's supply of basic commodities could be very much appreciated by us or others. So we would do well to listen to what we've been told and follow it explicitly. The story came from England during their siege of strikes, power blackouts, and three-day work weeks. A shop in a small British town carried a banner on its front window. By candle power, battery power, and willpower, we will open six days a week. That willpower apparently is the most important. There's some countries which prohibit savings or surpluses. We do not understand it, but it is true. We honor, obey, and sustain the laws of the country, which is ours. Where it is permitted, though, which is most of the world, we should listen to the counsel of the brethren and to the Lord. Recognizing that the family is the basic unit of both the church and society generally, we call upon Latter-day Saints everywhere to strengthen and beautify the home with renewed effort in these specific areas. Food production, preservation, storage, the production and storage of non-food items, fix up and clean up the homes and the surroundings. We wish to say another word or two about this in the next meeting. We encourage you to grow all the food that you feasibly can on your own property. And uh, with berry bushes, grape vines, fruit trees, plant them. And uh, if your climate is right for their growth, grow vegetables and eat them from your own yard. Even the, those residing in apartments or condominiums can generally grow a little food in pots and planters. Study the best methods of providing your own foods. Make your gardens neat and attractive as well as productive. If there are children in your home, involve them in the process with assigned responsibilities. What President Romney has just said is basic. Children should learn to work. They should, parents should not spend their nights and days trying to find something to interest their children. They should find something to occupy them and get them busy doing something that is worthwhile. Develop your skills in your home preservation and storage. We reaffirm the previous counsel the church has always given to acquire and maintain a year's supply, a year's supply of the, com of the basic commodities. And Brother Featherstone has pretty well outlined them for us. Wherever possible, produce your non-food necessities of life. Improve your sewing skills to sew and mend clothing for your family. All the girls want to learn to type. They all want to go to an office. They don't seem to want to sew anymore and to uh, uh, cleanse and protect and uh, renew the things that they use. Develop handicraft skills, as the sisters have told us, and make or build needed items. We encourage families to have on hand this year's supply, and we say it over and over and over, and repeat over and over the scripture of the Lord, where he says, Why, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? How vacant it is as they put their spirituality, so-called, into action and call him by his, his important names, but fail to do the things which he says. Keep in good repair and beautify your homes, your yards, farms, and businesses. Repair the fences, clean up and paint where needed. 
Keep your lawns and your gardens well groomed. Whatever your circumstance, let your premises reflect orderliness, beauty, and happiness. Plan well and carry out your plan in an orderly and systematic manner. Avoid debt. We used to talk about that a great deal, but today everything is seemingly geared toward debt. You get your cards and you buy everything on time and you're encouraged to do it. We don't need to do it. We have our own lives to live. From local sources, seek out reliable information on food and non-food pre preservation. If additional information is needed, the priesthood and the Relief Society leaders, may, you may write. Home production and storage and uh, at 50 North Main Street. Get all the information you need. We encourage all Latter-day Saint families to become self-reliant and independent. The greatness of a people and of a nation begins in the home. Let us dedicate ourselves to strengthening and beautifying the home in every way we can. It was Paul who wrote, Neither do we eat any man's bread for naught, but rot with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any man. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now then, that are, there are now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse, worse than an infidel. I'm so grateful for the inspiration of the brethren who have helped once again fasten and atten our attention on the particular matters involved in the priesthood welfare program. I appreciate the long time devotion and leadership of President Romney in this important cause. I cannot think of the priesthood welfare program how we would do things without him. The Lord's way builds individual self-esteem and develops and heals the dignity of the individual, whereas the world's way depresses the individual, his views of himself and the causes, and it causes deep resentment. The Lord's way causes the individual to hasten his efforts to become economically independent again, even though he may have temporary need because of special conditions for help and assistance. The world's way deepens the individual's dependency on welfare programs and tends to make them demand more rather than encourage them to return to economic independence. The Lord's Way helps our members get a testimony for themselves about the gospel of work. For work is important to human happiness as well as productivity. The world's way, however, places greater and greater emphasis on leisure and upon the avoidance of work. Now please be careful, brethren, that we do all that we do within the law of the land. Where, wherever we are, let us become efficient in our production operations so that we don't merely go through the motions of having a welfare farm. The time will come when we will need all the products and more from our projects, even more than we do now. Do what you can to make our projects economically viable so that we don't rationalize that the welfare project is good simply because it gets men together. Even though it is good for the priesthood to labor side by side 
we can have the brotherhood of labor and the economic efficiency too. We must ever remind ourselves and all members of the church to keep the law of the fast. We often have our individual reasons for fasting, but I hope members won't hesitate to fast to help us lengthen our stride in our missionary efforts to open the way for the gospel to go to the nations where it is not now permitted to go. It's good for us to fast as well as to pray ever specific over specific things and over specific objectives. I've been grateful for the experience I had under the tutelage of my own father to wash with castile soap the harnesses and grease them to preserve them. I learned to paint the picket fence, the water tank, the carriage shed, the granary, the buggy and the wagon, and finally the house and since the days when I wore the occasional blister in my hands, I have not been sorry of those experiences. I've always felt to commend the sisters who tat and knit and crochet, who always have something new and sparkling about the place. We have always been pleased when we found young women who could make their own clothes and sew well and cook meals and keep the house tidy. It seems to be the idea these days that we just entertain them. We spend so much of our time trying to find ways to keep them interested. I see no disadvantages in work. I believe it was one of the clever and most important and necessary creations of our Father. My admiration almost had no bounds one day when a young man from Murray came in uh, to be interviewed for a mission. He'd saved $2,900 for his mission from his marine pay in three years and nine months and 15 days. And by doing odd jobs which others wished to escape and all he had $2,900 for his mission. Just a boy without a job, without a place, without a home, without somebody to keep him busy. But he caught the idea and went out and did other people's work on the boat, on the ship, and uh, saved his money for this important thing. Through the ages there have been many laws repealed, but we know of no divine repeal of the law of work. From the obscure life organs within the body to the building of the moon landing craft, work is one of the conditions of being alive. We have been told that every day work is a purposeful activity requiring an ex expenditure of energy with some sacrifice of leisure. Sir William Oster, a great physician of Canada, said that work was the master word in ongoing life. It's the touchstone of progress, the measure of success, and the fount of hope. It is directly responsible, he said, for all advantages in medicine and technology. I'm always distressed when I see clerks in stores and banks and offices who complain of their workload and are stingy with their efforts and who fear to give more than their pay would seem to compensate. I know the hours law and the other laws that control these things nowadays, but at least their attitudes couldn't be right. Only a week or so ago we sat in a restaurant and for a long time received no attention. Finally, we heard one girl say to the other, why don't you wait on those people? And the answer was, they're not in my assignment. But here they were standing over there, standing without anything apparently to do. Perhaps we need the compelling urgency of our forefathers. They had to work hard to survive. We have securities of this and that sort to make sure that we do not starve. Dr. D. Ewan Cameron, a psychiatrist, wrote this life 
is for living. And in it he said, for half a century we have heard the most moving of lamentations from employers over the passing of the old time worker, the fellow who really loved his work, who hung around until he was satisfied that the job was done, who would think out ways to do it better. This kind of worker has not disappeared from the job. It is his kind of job that has done the disappearing. Brethren and sisters, it, I'm sure it's time that I should close, but I want to commend the words of Sister Smith and the bishopric and President Romney to you and say that this is a gospel of action and whatever we learn we should put into action. God bless us that we may have the determination to carry forward all of these commandments of the Lord which have been portrayed to us. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.